All right, as I said, it's week number 101. Today we're going to get into John 18. Uh, we're going to get into some more action moments in the life of Jesus as he heads towards the Passion and the Cross. It's actually the first stage in the Passion journey uh, we begin today. But before we do that, a couple of uh, review notes. Where we've been uh, for the last several months, really, we've been talking about uh, Jesus' preparation for this moment of departure. Uh, really from, I, I like to think from John 13, but you could even go back as far as John chapter 12, uh, when Jesus changes the language from the hour is not yet come to the hour is at hand. In John 12, that changes. John 13 is when we see the, the washing of the feet and the beginning of kind of Jesus' final words to his disciples. That moves into the, what's traditionally known, of, known as the farewell discourse. In John 14 through John 16 and John 17 is the high priestly prayer, which we've been in the last several weeks. In these moments, Jesus has been in preparation for the imminent climax of his ministry. Um, in that preparation, he has uh, tried to prepare his disciples. Disciples in preparation for their very important work um, in light of his important work. He, he looks back on his own mi mission and own his own ministry to help them as they are getting ready themselves post-resurrection for their part in the work that they will accomplish in his name and for his sake. Uh, the connection between Jesus and his disciples, we talked about this the last several weeks, has to do a lot with the mission, the methods of accomplishing that mission, uh, the connection, uh, the unity that they have together, the unity they have with, with God, uh, also the, the challenges that they, were, that they will face in light of their standing with Jesus, um, and, and, and the connection between the challenges and the suffering that they will face they're going to begin to see that in a very real way in the chapters that, that we're about to jump into, 18, 19, and 20. Uh, they're going to see Jesus be insulted, arrested, uh, um, beaten, tortured, ultimately crucified. And what Jesus does in the previous chapters is to say, as the world hates me, so they will hate you. But again, he, he advises them that he overcomes all that and that they will have his joy, his peace, his hope, um, his love. Okay. Now, one of the things that Jesus has returned to in, in, in many fashions throughout the uh, farewell discourse in the high priestly prayer is this conversation about the name. Okay, His name. He, he talks about the disciples praying to him in his name. And at the end of John 17 and the end of the high priestly prayer uh, in verse 26, Jesus takes that and, go and, and points to the, the name of God, the Father, and ties that to his own ministry. He says, I have, Jesus says, I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Throughout John's gospel, this idea of the name, it's not just about the, the, the moniker of the deity. Um, but it's about the authority and the purpose of God. The name is representation of the purpose and the authority of God. Now, Understand that the name of God in the Old Testament, amongst the Jewish people, even to this day, is a holy thing. Because of its power, because of its, the representation of authority, they will not even utter the name of God. They won't write the name of God because of its uh, power and weight and, 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 and what it means. In fact, we, we look at the, the Ten Commandments. What does it say? Do not take what? The Lord's name in vain. It's, it's a representation of who God is. Now, when Jesus comes, the name, the authority, the power of God, it, it comes to earth. It becomes one of us in a very real and powerful way. So when Jesus says, I've made known to them your name, what, what's happened is the veil of mystery and the veil of separation has been torn. That's when we 
project later on when, when Jesus is crucified, the literal physical veil of the temple between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple is torn asunder. What Jesus is saying here is, is he's actually made known the very power and authority of God and he will continue to make it known. This is a, an important aspect of where we're headed in, in even in John 18 imminently. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. So Robert asks, is there a change in the reverence to the name of God? Not a change in reverence, but a change in access. You can have access to something that you revere and still revere it and have intimate access to it. Um, if we... What happens is if we fail to revere the name of God, then we fail to understand how precious the access is. The reason that there was not the access before was to demonstrate the holy, holy both W-H-O-L-L-Y and H-O-L-Y, the holy, holy difference between us and the deity, between us and, and God. We're sinners, he's, he's pure and perfect, and we're separated and only one person, one time a year, can go in and only with the blood of the sacrifice to atone for the sins of the, the whole people and himself can go in. But even that wasn't guaranteed. When Jesus comes, the reverence remains, but the access is changed because the, 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 the permanent nature of his sacrifice creates that, that openness there. Right. That's, that's part of the access. Because now, not only are we given permission to have access to the Father, to, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, but now we're actually given access to, to some extent, the, the power of those things. But again, remember, we can't separate the conversation from power and access to that uh, abiding. That part, that part of the, the equation is the abiding. As, as, you, as Jesus says, those who abide in me and I in them, my word in them, as we're influenced by God, as we're influenced by Jesus Christ and his word, then we are, tra it's really the transformation happens in us, right? So we've talked about the idea of sanctification. It's not just, you know, your sins are forgiven, um, but it's also that your sins, not, not just that your sins are forgiven, that you're freed from the penalty of sin, but you're also freed from the power of sin and the influence of sin over your life. Not perfectly, because we still live in a fallen world, but we are enabled more and more to be transformed in the likeness of God. So that the access is not just the access of sinners to the Father, but the access of, of, of transformed saints to the Father. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So Jesus becomes that pass through, but he actually does allow us to pass through. Um, but the reverence doesn't change. Actually, I would think the way I would look at it is that reverence actually grows. We're going to see that in just a moment. I'm actually going to see that play out in visible fashion. Both, both reverence and access happen in the exact same scene in, at the beginning of John 18. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a good point. Now, just to, so you kind of understand where we've been from an action standpoint. We've been in a, in a long stretch of... Of, of, of talking, Jesus just teaching. He's just teaching. He's, a, he's in a monologue or a dialogue, depending on how much you, you take into consideration the disciples. Um, they've just been talking, talking, talking. They've been in the upper room. They've done the foot washing. Whether they exit during the farewell discourse or they're still in the upper room, that's up for debate. Um, but they've been kind of situated for a while, okay? What happens in John 13, other than the foot washing, is Judas departs. Remember, Judas has departed. That's, that's important from where we're going. Remember, Judas has not, Judas has been with Jesus all the way up until the post washing of the feet. He was there at the foot washing, then he departs. Throughout the farewell discourse, throughout the high priestly prayer, Judas has not been physically present. Um, as we enter John 18 verse 1, the beginning, the time of preparation of 
is over and the time of action has come. That's what we get in the very first verse. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples. So the idea is that John is using that, that little phrase, when Jesus has spoken these words, to, to indicate a transition from what has happened to what's about to happen. What has happened is a lot of preparation, a lot of teaching. What's about to happen is preparation's over, now it's time for the game. Now it's time to actually, to actually uh, accomplish what's been set out. Not that the teaching wasn't a part of the mission, but now it's time to get to, to the, the action of, of the scene. So verse 1, we're going to talk a little bit about the location because a lot of people get interested in location uh, type things. Uh, it says, when Jesus spoke of these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he had entered, uh, which he and his disciples entered. Okay, so I want to stop right there. First, we get the, the term Kidron. Uh, the, word, uh, the word that's translated brook, um, is it translated differently in anybody else's um, Bible, is it any other word used to describe the brook, Kidron? The valley, okay, Bruce? Uh, in this one, you, you garden. This says an olive okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. Anything else besides, you says valley, okay? The, the, literal trans, the literal word here is actually, um, it actually means a winter swell. What that means is that for most of the months out of the year, it is a valley. It's just a valley. But during the rainy season in Jerusalem, which is wintertime, the rains come and it swells up. It becomes a brook. It becomes a running stream. Um, that's literally what it means. And um, it's located, um, because I know some of you guys are really into maps. There's a map right there. It's located uh, to the kind of the eastern side of Jerusalem. So here is, well, that's not going to be the right color. Let's do this. So it's located right along here. Okay, that's the Kidron Valley. And you actually see it says Kidron Valley right there. Um, but it becomes a brook um, during the winter seasons. Okay, and, and it says that Jesus, that they went out from somewhere in Jerusalem and they crossed the brook. Now, where did they cross? Well, we're going to get to that in a second, but they actually crossed right here. And for those that are eagle-eyed and can really see it, I can't make it any larger. This right here says Garden of Gethsemane, right there. Um, and if you've ever been to the Garden of Gethsemane in Israel, it is literally, you, you cross that valley, it's right there. And, and historians typically are pretty unified in the placement of the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, one of the interesting things about this Kidron Valley and the mention of the Kidron Valley here in this context is that some scholars, and I kind of, because of the way John references and makes allusions to the Old Testament throughout the gospel, uh, I think this is a pretty compelling, uh, compelling connection. They actually make a connection between the betrayal of Judas and, uh, and, and, and this particular event in Jesus' life with an event in King David's life. If you look at 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 17, in that account, David is fleeing from the murderous intention of his son Absalom. Absalom wants to be king. Solomon has been, uh, it's been told that he's going to be king. Absalom is very upset about this and wants to kill his dad, David. Um, over the course of those events, David is betrayed by a very close counselor, um, Ahithophel, Ahithophel. And, uh, and Ahithophel later hangs himself. Um, which is very it, one of only two people that hang themselves in the whole Bible. Um, anyone want to tell me who the other one is? Judas. Judas and Ahithophel are the only ones. Um, whether and, and it also mentions in Second Samuel fifteen through seventeen that in fleeing from Absalom they cross. You guessed it, the brook Kidron, and they use the exact same language, but in Hebrew rather than Greek. So. There is some, some linguistic connection. Whether John intends that or not, uh, that specific instance is in his mind. We do know typologically that David is connected to Jesus at 
many points in David's own life, and that's without question. Um, one of the other things that we're told about the location is that, whoops, is that they enter a garden. Now, it, we saw back in that last, in the thing, it's at the head of the Kidron Valley, just across from the, uh, just across from the, the city walls of Jerusalem. We know from the Synoptic Gospels that the, the garden is called Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means an oil press or an olive press, an olive grove. Uh, actually means an olive press. And when you have an olive press, you also have an olive grove next to it. Um, John calls it a garden. And if you, again, if you've been there, it makes sense that you would call it a garden. It's a walled enclosure. They enter into it. There's an entry point to it, which means there's also an exit point to it. And uh, it looks very much like a garden full of olive trees with these knotted olive uh, trees throughout it. Um, John doesn't call it an olive grove, not because it's not an olive grove, but because he wants to make the connection, I think, that it is a garden. Um, I think because, again, John is really good at making Old Testament allusions, I think in his mind, uh, he's making a greater literary connection with a point in redemptive history that is of very apt significance. Um, another place, and we'll talk about that in just a second, another place John makes a, a point of saying in John chapter 19 that, uh, and John chapter 20 that Jesus was crucified and buried in a garden. He was crucified outside the garden and buried in the garden. He says it twice, he mentions the garden. So in three different cases, he uses this phraseology of garden. Now, why would that be so significant? Anybody want to take a guess? There you go. And circle gets the square. Um, you guys should know it's a Genesis reference. Absolutely. Uh, John, I think, I think it's, I think it's a right call to say that John is making a connection with the garden of Eden. He's the only one that calls it a garden. He's the only one that makes the connection that it's a garden. He's also the only gospel writer that doesn't start with the birth of Jesus. He starts with the birth of the whole planet. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, that's an obvious reference to Genesis chapter 1. Jesus, as he makes the turn toward the cross, the defeat of the prince of this world, the enemy of Genesis 3, which also happens, to hap it happens in a garden, is imminent. The problems that began in the garden of Eden are resolved in the garden of crucifixion, in the garden of resurrection, and they begin in this garden of Gethsemane. In verse 2, we know that this garden was well known to the disciples. Now Judas, it says, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. It was well known to them in Luke chapter 21, verse 37. It describes the practice that Jesus would come, uh, would go to the temple to teach, in Jerusalem, and then they would retreat, not retreat like they were fleeing from something, but they would go as a retreat to this garden, actually staying in the garden, camping out there in that garden. And, um, and it says they lodge, would lodge there. Judas, of course, knows that this is their regular kind of practice, and it makes it easier for him to betray them. Uh, the, the mention of Judas really begins to set the action in motion. It begins to set the action in motion uh, really swiftly. And we get kind of some, some, real, uh, some real tense moments because of Judas' arrival. When John describes Judas' betrayal, he does so somewhat differently than the synoptics. In the synoptics, how does Judas betray Jesus? with a kiss. We know that. John doesn't mention the kiss, but instead mentions two other places, uh, two other uh, modes of betrayal. The kiss is representative, obviously, of larger scale betrayal by Judas, um, but 
for John, John doesn't want to get caught up in what Judas does in that, mo- in that moment, what, but what he has done leading up to that moment. So the first thing that, John, that Judas does as an act of betrayal is to take the soldiers to a place he knew Jesus would be. Judas knew the routines of Jesus and the disciples. He knew about the garden. He also knew about approximately what time Jesus would be there. And because the hour has come, Jesus could have... Or it, 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 Jesus knows everything. We're going to talk about his knowledge in a, in a second. But if Jesus was not giving up his life, and he knows Judas is going to betray him, what would, Judas have, what would Jesus have done? He would have gone someplace else. It wasn't, I mean, Jerusalem is a big city. Jesus had a lot of people who, who were on his side. And yet he goes to a place that he knows is, is, is in the mind of Judas, that Judas would have been very acquainted with, that Judas knows that he would have gone to. He does not change routine because he's ready for the cross. It's time. He's not evading capture or arrest. Therefore, Judas takes the arresting guards to the place he was confident in finding Jesus. Now that gets us to the other point of Judas' betrayal. It says, now Judas who betrayed him also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. In verse 3, so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Judas does two things as his act of betrayal. The first thing he does is he knows the place and he he goes there. The second thing is he's the one who is mentioned as bringing the soldiers. He's the one that procures the the arresting squad. So uh, these forces are from two very different sources of people. Uh, The band of soldiers that are mentioned means this is a portion of a cohort of Roman soldiers. Typically, a cohort would be between 600 and 1,000 men. Now, that does not mean that's how many Judas brought into the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not likely that Judas would have garnered enough respect to even get 100 soldiers. However, this is what time of year in the Jewish calendar? It's Passover. That means every Jewish person that can get there is there. It's also a time of typically high uh, emotion regarding the presence of the Roman, uh, the Roman government because uh, they have to use Roman coins, which means that they are using uh, symbols of idolatry and they're there for the whole, one of the holiest of holidays. So there's all of this uh, in the background that they start to resent ha- that the Romans are there. So typically during Passover, the Roman government would send larger uh, portions of the army uh, of forces to Jerusalem to, to dissuade any would-be uh, rebels from from sparking a riot, and to tamp down any rioting that would exist. Um, and since Jesus the rep, already had a reputation as being a leader, I mean, remember what happens just a week before. Jesus rides in on a donkey to enormous fanfare, to enormous chance of, of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, chance of kingship are given to Jesus. So Judas probably has at least enough cachet to get several dozen, if not a hundred Roman soldiers to come in to the Garden of Gethsemane because Jesus is a potential uh, rebel. Yeah, Jeff. That is a great question. That the, uh, Jeff asked, what is driving Judas to do this? And uh, the answer is we don't really know. Uh, there's a lot of conjecture. There are some, I'll give you kind of the two most popular ones. Uh, Judas, or John, if you read John's gospel only, and that's the only source that you have for understanding Judas, the motivation would be entirely greed. Uh, he thinks that Jesus is going to get him a place of honor. He thinks that Jesus is going to help him be upwardly mobile. Um, get him respect. Uh, he sees Jesus as a person who can, in fact, overthrow the government, and he wants to be on the inside of that. 
Uh, he, John says that Jesus is the one that carries the, that Judas is the one that carries the money purse and that he likes to steal from it. So there's that greed factor. When Judas realizes that this is not going to happen, scholars believe he sells Jesus out because he thinks, well, at least I can get 30 pieces of silver out of this. Um, that's one interpretation. Uh, a more charitable interpretation is that Judas wants Jesus to be the Messiah. He wants Jesus to be the leader that overthrows the Roman government, not so much out of greed, but out of, out of uh, uh, loyalty to his country. But he believes that Jesus needs a push. He believes that Jesus needs a push in the direction of, of sparking the rebellion, so to speak. And so some scholars believe that, Jesus, that Judas is doing this to raise Judas's or raise Jesus um, temperature to call forth the angels and call forth the armies and raise up a, 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 a battalion of of you know people to go and fight the Roman government. Yeah, to to some people believe that in a more charitable interpretation of Judas, uh, I'm gonna tell you I tend to think that Judas was was selfish and he was he was greedy. That's what the weight of Scripture tends to lean towards. Uh, a more charitable uh, interpretation of who Judas is is not as supported by the Scripture, I don't think. Definitely not supported by John at all. I mean, John doesn't give you an, uh, doesn't not give you an out, but yeah. So, yeah, Nancy. John 13 does say that, <coughs> that the, the spirit of, of, I can't remember the exact phraseology, the spirit of the evil one had entered Satan, or had entered Judas. Um, John, though, is very clear that Judas was already on this path. Earlier on, when, when, when Judas makes a ruckus about, <coughs> when Judas makes a, a fuss about, about Mary and the, the, the expensive perfume, uh, and Judas is the one that says, "Hey, wait a minute! Couldn't this money have been sold? Uh, this been sold, and the money given to the poor?" John said. John makes it clear. Judas isn't saying that because he cared about the poor. He's saying it because he held the money bags and he wanted to take a cut. That's. I mean, that's really what it says. So, I don't want to get. I and you guys know how I feel about the idea that Satan made me do it. Um, I. I think we give Satan a lot too much power, and we don't take enough ownership of our own sinfulness. Judas was a part of God's redemptive plan. His actions were still sinful, and therefore he was accountable for them. Um, and so in the redemptive history of things, God, always, God is always capable and uses the sinful actions of human beings to accomplish his redemptive purpose. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you should mention that. Uh, Robert asked, are there other places where that happens? There are. Uh, it's interesting that um, most of those, or the most prominent ones, are associated with enemies of David. It's like Saul, for example. It says evil spirits tormented Saul. Um, at, like internally tormented him. And David can't, comes to play the harp. And it was actually those that kind of are equated with Saul's uh, seeking to destroy David as well, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a semantic difference to some extent. I think uh, it's not the devil necessarily. Uh, again, like you said, um, Satan is not omnipresent. Um, he's not omniscient. He doesn't have the powers of God. Um, but he does have servants that do only his bidding, or, or do according to... Again, remember, what's the overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming motivating factor of Satan is simply rebellion against God. It's simply rebellion against God. And so anything that's rebellion against God is working towards the ends of Satan. Um, but again, that doesn't leave a person without responsibility. 
And that's the thing I think we struggle with. We say, well, Satan is, is, is active force. Yeah, it's an active tempting force. And the spirit of something could simply mean the motivating factor of something. So if the motivating factor of Satan is rebellion, Judas's motivating factor is rebellion against Jesus. It's the same spirit. Right? You can say, what's the spirit of America? Right? We could say independence and freedom. Someone can be, have the spirit of America and not be an American. Do you see what I'm saying? So that, that word can be both metaphysical, it can, but it can also be motivational. Or it can be both. Judas is an interesting character. And uh, one that you can speculate a, a ton about. But what's interesting is what Jesus does in this moment, how Jesus reacts to this betrayal. Now remember, uh, Ju- Jesus has already called Judas out as the betrayer, and Judas leaves. Judas departs and exits to do what he's called um, to do. What's interesting about Judas bringing these, uh, the, these forces to bear on Jesus is that he not only brings this Roman, uh, this Roman contingent of soldiers, he also, it says, brings... Um, uh, officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. We would think of them as temple guards. We've seen the temple guards before in John chapter 6, which we'll talk about probably not today. We're probably not going to get to that. Um, but it's interesting that Judas was able to bring two very different forces together. The temple guard and the Roman soldiers, they were not at all uh, necessarily uh, allies in any stretch of the that word. The temple guards were meant to help keep the, the holiness of the temple pure and secure, while the Romans were only interested in law and order. But what Judas is able to do is able to, uh, and the Pharisees obviously have some, and the, and the, the uh, re- religious leaders also have some say in this, they're able to demonstrate that Jesus is a threat on both fronts. He's a, he's a threat to the holiness of the temple, and he's a threat to the peace and the well-being of the Roman government in, the, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Now, why do the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the religious leaders want the Roman government's peace and security? Because they've found themselves a nice little niche of power in the middle of it all. Uh, but it is, it's, it, it is interesting uh, that representatives that that these two groups are represented in arresting Jesus. Now, D.A. Carson looks at that and says, who's against Jesus? Everybody's against Jesus. Both Jews and Gentiles are against Jesus. These two groups represent the arrest by the whole world in, in, in the presence of these two different groups um, as well. Now, Jesus' reaction demonstrates, again, he's fully in control of what's going on. Verse uh, 4, it says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Now I want to stop right there for just a second. All the Gospels indicate that Jesus is fully aware of what is going to take place. In the synoptics, he makes blunt predictions. And his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane demonstrates he has knowledge of the events before they take place. But in John's gospel, it's even stronger. As he stated in uh, John chapter 10, verse 18, no one takes Jesus' life, but he gives it up willingly, and he can take it up again. Here it shows he knows what's happening. He could avoid this. He could keep running. He could have gone to Bethany. He could have gone back to Galilee. He had friends all over the place. He could have gotten away, but he knows what's going to take place. And not only does he know what's going to take place, he knows underneath the surface at a deeper, more foundational level, why it's taking place. When Jesus asks the arresting uh, officers, whom do you seek? It's not because he's unaware that they're looking for him. It's not that he's unaware that they are looking for him to arrest and take into uh, to, to prison and to, to be um, interrogated. He's not hiding. He's giving himself up freely. John wants his audience to make no mistake about who really has the power in the situation. It's not Judas. It's not the arresting officers. It's Jesus. Yeah, Bruce. Um, I think he's kind of challenging them, but he's also, again, he's what does he pray at the end of John 17 and, and chap, verse 26? He says, I've made known to them your name 
and I will continue to make it known. He says, whom do you seek? And then their answer is very interesting. They say, they tell him who, 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 who they seek, who, and that's Jesus of Nazareth. What's interesting about that is that is Jesus' most, uh, it's Jesus most human name. It's not just his given name, but it's also indicating the location. Jesus is a, actually a pretty popular name at this time in uh, Jewish history in the first century in Palestine. So they have to designate. It's not just Jesus. You couldn't just go and say, I want to see Jesus. It'd be like saying, I want to go see John, you know, in, in the United States. And, and like, you know, five people raise their hand. You go into a room and say, I want to see Jesus. Five people would raise their hand. So it's that I want to see Jesus of Nazareth, this person who's from the town of Nazareth. This is about his earthly hometown identity. Yet, when, they, when, when he responds back to them, he says, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. What does he say? I am he. Now, do you want to guess what he actually says in the Greek? I am. We add the he. Or in some translations it says, it is I. But the Greek is actually, um, it's actually the phrase, ego a me, which means I am. It's the phrase that Jesus uses in all the I am statements. When he says, I am the good shepherd. When he says, I am the light of the world. When he, when he says, I am the bread of life. All of them begin with ego a me. When Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am ego a me. It's the Greek, uh, the Greek um, way of saying Yahweh, the Old Testament name of God. The name that God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 from the burning bush. Whom shall I say has sent me to Pharaoh and to set the people free? God says, I am. Tell them I am has sent you. It's the name that is so holy, as I mentioned earlier, the Jewish people wouldn't even utter it. They wouldn't even write it. They wrote it like this without, the, uh, without all the, the vowels. Um, they didn't have vowels in the same way we have vowels, but actually what they did was they reiterated it. They rearranged it. They reset it so that we get the name Jehovah. Jehovah is actually just a, a, um, a distortion of the word Yahweh in order to have a name for God. I say, well, Jehovah's the name of God. Jehovah's not the name of God. Jehovah is the name that was created so that the people of Israel could say a name for God, but not say the name of God because they didn't want to, um, they didn't want to offend God by using that name. When Jesus says, whom, asks the question, whom do you seek? They say a very human name, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus points out, no, 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 I am Jesus of Nazareth, but I'm also, I am. I am. The power of the divinity is so present in Jesus that he all, just, he says, I am. I am Jesus of Nazareth, but I also am, I am. And at this, the response of the soldiers is to draw back and fall to the ground. Um, we're going to stop right there because we're going to talk a little bit about this next week. Um, but just think about the weight of that. They come seeking this very human person, and Jesus is a very human person, but also within him is the power of the name of the Father, which he continues to reveal to all who seek him, whether they seek him for good or they seek him for negative purposes. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us, that you are Jesus of Nazareth, you are, are I am, and that you love us with an unfailing love. We pray, Lord, as uh, we seek to understand that love in a, in a better way, that we would feel it in our souls, not just understand it in our minds, and that it would uh, be the, 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 the thing that compels us into lives of service for you to love others in the way that you have loved us. Pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your day.